Will Gregory is one of the great electronic musicians of our time. He's half of Goldfrap, he's a composer for film and TV, and he even has his own Moog ensemble. We visited Will's studio to discover his favourite synths and hear them in action. So many years one had been in basements or, you know, places that were really not very habitable, but somehow you could put a studio in it for some reason. And um, I remember looking at all my artist friends who always had these amazing spaces with light because they needed light. And I thought, well, I need light. You know, it's not, I know I don't technically, but, you know, spiritually I do. So it was great to find this place that had big picture windows and lots of daylight and then just gradually filled it up with um, too many synthesizers and bits of kit, you know. So now, even though it's quite a big place, there's not a lot of room to move. The two kind of activities that go on here, are obviously with Alison, done a lot of um, writing and, um, you know, making albums and from that point of view, you're looking for sounds that are inspiring. And that's what a lot of the old instruments we feel give you. And that's how they justify their presence. Even if they've only made one sound that has got onto the album, that in itself is a justification. You know, if you can find one sound that does it, that's so much better than trying to compromise by layering things up to get that sound. So that's something that I've learned you know, quite often. I mean, I remember going and mixing with um, Spike Stent and him just sort of raising an eyebrow as he was labeling the desk saying, bass number nine, you know, and um, me thinking, oh shit, yeah. <laughs> Should have been a little bit more kind of minimal here. So this is a Roland Jupiter four, which, um, I like it's only got four notes. It's only four note polyphonic, but um, it's got a great arpeggiator, um, and it through the it's got an external clock in a standard, so you can sync that with a little clock box from MIDI, so I can run it from Logic on the computer, the tempo. Is what we're doing at the moment, it's just running off the temper logic. It will play everything up and down four octaves. Sometimes they're not so useful, but... So if I ask Ali to change the tempo on Logic, you're going to hear how it, it will just follow whatever we're doing. That's nice.
Yeah. Anyway, you can sit there for hours just dreaming away, can't you, and having a nice time. Um, maybe you get a piece of music out of it at the end. Um, but it's just a... Uh, it's one of the fav my favourite of the Jupiter range. Um, and I haven't got a Jupiter 8, um, but I think I'm okay without one. You know, we never demoed anything. We never sat down with guitars or pianos and tried to write songs like that. It was always the song would come from the sound of what we were doing. And um, so that means just having all these lovely old bits of kit nearly to hand and around was, was crucial. And then the other thing that goes on here is writing to picture, which is a completely different um, set of parameters because you're trying to usually come up with something quite quickly that fulfills a brief that you already have or that you've already negotiated and for that you know you kind of need to be able to work quickly and so it's kind of the opposite thing you know you're not having the blissful time of searching endlessly for that ideal sound you're just going to go that'll do get it down put some picture you know put it to picture does it work yes it does no it doesn't you know try something else bang 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 so in that sense it's also has to be you know like everything I usually have a little guest synth that I've, I want to find out more about because I've neglected it and um, see if that will fit with the project. And so that's usually around here somewhere and uh, I need a big poly synth usually and um, just loads of outboard. And so that's like a little nest that goes on here when we're doing something to picture. I mean, the, um, I don't really use this to record, uh, uh, but for the Moog Ensemble, um, for me, because I'm a sax player anyway, this is a better way of getting to the keyboard. Um, and it brings a lot more, um, well, it just gives you more access to what the Mini Moog can do, um, because it's got all these different octaves. So obviously on a keyboard, you've got three, but here we've got six. The other thing you've got is the breath control is linked via MIDI to the filter input. So you can, the harder you blow, the more open the filter is, which means you can... Um, yeah, you know, just it's a really nice way of um, talking to the Mini Moog. Um, and then we were talking earlier, you can tongue quickly on it in a way that's hard to do. Um, it does make one play a bit music -y. That's the only thing I've got to be careful of. You know, it's very easy to sort of do the, you know, um, yeah, it can be, a, you've got a taste barrier that you've got to stay the right side of. But for playing, you know, when we do the Wendy Carlos um, style uh, Bach or a lot of the other pieces, it's great because, um, yeah, you just you can fly around it so much more quickly than everybody else is, you know. Um. It's quite hard to do that on a keyboard. Um, so anyway, and also I'm not very good at playing the keyboard, so this is this is more fun for me. 
So that's a kind of quick whistle stop. But I mean, what's amazing to me is that this is an 80s bit of kit, um, whereas you know, this is a, a late 60s thing. And with this, which is a, um, you know, a 2000 bit of kit, we can combine them to make it all, they all talk to each other. So, uh, yeah, this is probably designed to work with a DX7 or something like that. But because we can retro um, MIDI into the CV, um, you know, suddenly it all works together. So it feels like we've sort of got a bit of a golden age. Oh, you know, I haven't really tried it uh, with many of the other synths that I've got. I think it just seems to be the most versatile. Um, it's obviously got the warmest bottom, you know, it's just a, it's just a lovely... You know, we do quite a lot of John Carpenter um, pieces. It does that, even though that was all done on a probably Roland gear, wasn't it? And um, and then you know when you're getting into the the Wendy thing, um, you know you can quite quickly. Yeah, it just seems to cover a lot of bases, really. Um, you can hear how just uh, how how hard I blow will. You can directly hear how it's opening the filter up there. Um, and it's just lovely and responsive like that. But you've inspired me with that question to try and plug it into a few other things and see what happens. Because um, I'm sure that, that could also be really good. Um, but, you know, the Mini Moog is the kind of instrument that is the last, the first to go out of the building in a fire, I think, really, isn't it? So um, it's just a lovely, it doesn't do everything. Of course it doesn't, um, but it does quite a lot. How do you start writing um, a song? Do you get a sequencer? Do you do it on MIDI? Do you, what do you do? And I think what's so brilliant in our age and has been like this for a while is that hard disk recording gives you this kind of infinite palette. You know, you haven't got to worry about filling up tape. Um, you can just put it in a cycle record. So quite often for me, I would be having things in cycle record, just playing around with things. And then you just go, that, that, what was that? What was that? Or you'd listen back and go, that bit, what, what was that? Let's, let's look at that. And yeah, that sounds good. What happens if we loop it? But actually change this note. And then you can, you can sort of improvise, in other words, but then kind of be forensic about your dreaming afterwards and select something that maybe even at the time you didn't notice you'd done. And... Um, so that's revolutionized composition, I think, you know, literally just big hard disks. Um, so improvisation, I think, is a, is a big part of it. But how you get there, you know, whether you're improvising on a synth or on a sequencer or on a drum or whatever it is, you know, but I think just try and record it. Um, you know, we used to, before, before the big hard disk, we just have a cassette running, you know, and, and then listen back. Uh, especially, you know, working with Alison, we love to improvise. And Alison's just such a great improviser. Uh, and then hopefully something would happen, you know, and some days it wouldn't, some days it wouldn't. But you'd always, you, you know, you had to give yourself the time to listen back. That was quite hard sometimes, you know, you want to just carry on, but actually listen back, see what happened. And there might be something there that can get you started on something. Yeah, this is the um, the Wasp made by a company called Electronic Dream Plant. Um, I think they were based in Cambridge. Uh, anyway, it's a it's one of a few instruments that they brought out um, that has become a bit of a classic. It's so basic; it's only got you know a few knobs. It weighs virtually nothing. Um, 
um, when you listen to it on its own, it sort of sounds pretty nothingy out of its own little speaker. Although I guess you could record like that, but obviously when you plug it in, you get that from the actual... It's got three filter modes. It's got band and high pass. So it's really good for nasty little sort of sizzly things. I guess that's where it gets its name from, really. Um, but I use it quite a lot for sweeping effects. If you're just watching something and something happens that has a kind of a sweeping kind of emotional or whatever it is, visual thing, it's pretty immediately hands-on. It has a little sequencer called a spider that goes with it that is very... Although I think you can... I've got a kit to, you know, CV it to MIDI. But actually it's more, I think, useful just to play it for an effect or... Yeah, talking about the the PS3300, um, which is about the most over-the-top polysynth you could ever imagine, because it's uh, three polysynths, and it's totally polyphonic, three times. So there's 48 notes per synth. So if you did that, it plays all of them three times. And uh, it's got all these extra, you know, each polysynth has got its own two LFOs and anyway, it'll wobble in, a, in more ways than anything else I've got. So it, it can sound very rich very quickly. Um, and then because it's three, you know, you can pan them three ways. So you can make it very wide in the way that you want. And so, I mean, quite often, you know, I don't really change it very much. I'm just going to go, oh, yeah, that's that's a lovely warm thing. Filter it a bit. Oh, look, the sun's coming up. Or, you know what I mean? It just sort of has a... It's not a string synth. It's not, um, you know, a pad that you've heard before from anything digital. It, and it's, it's got its own character. Um, and it's just super warm, you know. So I love it. And And... With the pedals, you know, you can just pedal the filter up and down a bit and there you are. And inside are just card after card after card after, probably 48 cards, each with their own envelope, their own filter, their own everything. Um, so it's a complete insane proposition. I think it got to that stage, didn't it, with, with synthesizer design where they wanted the, the, the kind of golden holy grail was total polyphony you know this is the limitation of a mini moog it can't play more than one note at a time or if it can it doesn't sound very good so yeah more and more kind of crazy kind of investment went into trying to make these things totally polyphonic um, and the results were that nobody could afford to buy them and nobody could afford to make them um, so this I think there are only 50 ever made. I don't know how many there are left. Um, but it's a, just a madly 
lovely thing. It, um, and also you can control it from the foot pedal. Um, So it's a kind of cluster machine, you know, you can really... It's slightly blowing up. And now it's decided to play. I think it doesn't like them being played from MIDI as much as I do. <laughs> I think it gets a bit uh, cross about it. Sometimes we have to just turn it off and on and hopefully now it's doing something else. It's that one. There we go. So yeah, you have to kind of massage it a bit. Um, it should come with its own keyboard. I haven't managed to find one yet um, that, that plugs in there. Uh, but it's great because you can record it in MIDI, you know, so it just, it's great. You can, because I'm such a rubbish keyboard player, I can just edit it after I've played it. Just doing things like that. And it will in. Yeah, I mean, and then of course you've got all the edit editability and cross patching um, possibilities as well, um, which, you know, that's a bit endless. <laughs> So how do you yeah, introduce randomness or um, the unexpected uh, or the undeliberate, should we say? Uh, yeah, some synths come with built-in um, kind of waywardness that is definitely a blessing that they can make you do things that you wouldn't otherwise have done. With simple things like maybe the lead wasn't plugged in and they go, bah, 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 you know, because it, or could be anything like that. In fact, I would say that uh, more than 50% of composition is, is um, mistakes or, you know, things that you don't plan. I think um, whenever I've tried to plan things, uh, that's usually the kiss of death. Um, but obviously it's an insecure feeling where you haven't got a plan. But I think it's learning to live with that insecurity that is uh, useful to do. I think it's quite difficult, um, especially as you do it over and over again and you, you, you know, nothing changes, you still find yourself in that insecure point of that gray area of this is good, is this right? Is, should I be doing this? Have I stepped over the line? Have I, am I too safe? You know, is this dull? I don't know, you know, you just have to say, I don't know and 
just keep going. And um, hopefully at some point you will know, but it's okay if you don't right now. And I think synths can do that, you know, as well, because they, they don't know, but they sometimes know something that you don't. <laughs> if they can do something that makes you respond because it wasn't something that you've done, that is great, I think. I remember um, playing a, a, a bass line, boom, 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 like that, and for some reason I'd left the mic on, so it picked up all the clattering of the keys. Anyway, that became part of the rhythm track. Um, I couldn't get rid of it, <laughs> so it had to be used. Um, but with a bit of editing, you know, it, uh, we could put it in time, and that's a big part of the sound of the track now, um, and that was a total mistake. The Polymoog, I think you should probably think of it as another white elephant um, from that golden age of trying to make all the synths polyphonic, and it probably was just too complicated for the technology at the time for them to do it, but they had a jolly good go, um, and the idea was you had presets, that's a sort of harpsichord preset, But that was a piano, apparently. This is the harpsichord. That's called funk. I guess it's for someone who just wanted to play and, you know, plug and go. Um, so that's the string patch, but then what you could do um, when the red lights are on, that means the, that's all your preset mode. So then you have to turn all the red lights off and then you get into the actual editing mode. Uh, and one of the things this has is a, is a resonant filter section, which is here. So you could really... quality of the sound. tune it and then you've got a kind of amount of modulation that you can apply I'm by no means a master of how this thing works, but you can see it's involving. <laughs> I could be standing here for another half an hour just, you know, playing around before I even uh, realise that I've missed my dinner. Um, it's, a, it's a beautiful thing in that, from that period when since uh, was searching around for polyphony and how to make that work uh, in a way that sort of money was no object. And I think they assumed that the purchasers were in the same sort of mindset. And unfortunately, I don't think that was true. Um, so they had to skimp on things. And so with these, apparently the power supply was a terrible uh, thing. And, and actually all synths 
rely on the stability of their power supply. And it, yeah, it's a, it was a problem that then people found them very unreliable. And um, yeah, the whole thing kind of folded. But this one is kind of nearly back to life and it is an exciting thing. It's an exciting thing to play. You can put sounds through it so I could use this resonator as a, an external filter. Um, it's just endlessly versatile with these rather cute little sliders, um, which makes a nice change from knobs. And actually you can get many more knobs or sliders on rather than you would be able to fit you know, circular knobs. So I think they, they were onto something here. Um, but it's a, it's a delight. That's all for now. If you like what you saw, please be sure to like and share it and subscribe and click the bell icon so you know when we upload new content to our YouTube. Also find us on Twitter, Instagram and Facebook. Thanks for watching.